Let's welcome Pastor Jim. Well, good morning, good morning. All right, I got two titles for today. Healing Accidentally. Okay. Or, or How Faith Really Works. And so we'll, uh, so I'll, I'll just go for it. So I remember, even as a kid, I was always just kind of marveled at the stories of Jesus. Just the, the miracle stories, those were just always my favorite stories. And uh, just, but somehow it just never occurred that I could actually be part of those stories. It always seemed like kind of something far off, someone for the special man of God with a special ministry named after themselves and the poofy hairdo and the white suit and all that good stuff. But then I started to understand Jesus did those things as a man, right? He did it th- those things as a man submitted to God, fully empowered by the Holy Spirit. And once you realize that, it's impossible to stay satisfied just remaining the same. It's like, hold on, if Jesus was able to do those things as a man, that means that we get to do those things as a man. Are we okay? And so uh, we're tasked to heal the sick. We may not do it well, but we don't have a right to change the commission. Okay? So, yeah, even though, even though we may not be great at it, we, we haven't arrived, but we've left. All right? And so the commission is still the same. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, cast out demons. And so, uh, so we're in a series where we're looking over the shoulder of Jesus. A series is called Heal Like Jesus. There's 26 miracle stories of Jesus, and uh, are we going to go through all 26? I think we are. I think we're going to. So what we're going to start doing, though, in the new year, uh, starting uh, February, March, April, and May, the last Sunday of the month, we're going to turn into a healing service. And so uh, we're going to still go through the stories. We're going to have more abbreviated worship to leave time for more uh, ministry time. And so I'm just encouraging guys, put the word out. Bring the six. So we had, uh, we've done, one time we did a cancer-free Sunday. And I think um, eight out of the 12 people were uh, instantly uh, healed, visibly, like tumors dissolved, things shifted. And so, um, and so, yeah, so starting in February, we're going to do that. And um, guess who's going to be praying for the sick? You is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hope you are like, pointing at me. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's me up there. Everybody, I just come to, no, no, we're, we're, we're taking them to Jesus. And so, so pay attention, okay, because these things are to equip you, uh, not to impress you, all right? So, uh, yeah, so what we're doing is we want to meditate on these stories. And so if, you'll know, if you're on the Zion Facebook page, you'll notice I'm giving you the uh, scriptures a week in advance. And so tomorrow I'll give you the story. Uh, you'll be looking at the story. I'll be looking at our first dead raising story next Sunday. <laughs> Super excited about that. And so we'll, uh, yeah, so d- just follow along. It's going to be good. All right, Mark chapter 5, verse 21. Some of you got your scripture sheets. The, it'll be up on the slides. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, why does it say crossed again? Because if you remember, um, the story from last week was the gathering demoniac. Remember that? And so Jesus had been ministering all day on the shores of Galilee, gets in a boat, life-threatening storm, demonically inspired, tornado-like. Jesus calms the storm. The the disciples are freaking out. They're afraid. Jesus goes all the way uh, over there to minister to one guy, the gathering demoniac, gets him set free. uh, 2,000 pigs run into the water. People are freaking out. And so the disciples were afraid when they saw Jesus' authority. Now the people of the uh, ten cities, uh, the, the Gentile town, they're afraid, and they're like, Jesus, can you move? Can you leave? Remember, Jesus sends the uh, gathering demoniac. He's like, he's like, the gathering demoniac wants to come with Jesus. And Jesus is like, no, go tell everybody what the Lord has done. And so now he's coming back over. You can imagine Jesus, you can almost hear him crying out for sleep, right? I mean, he's been ministering all day. You know, he gets, catches a little cat nap in the boat, you know, he ministers all night because the people come in the morning. Now he's coming back here, so here we go. So he's coming back, a great, a great co- crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came out one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by his name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she might be made well and live. And Jesus went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, so she had menstrual bleeding for 12 years. And who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Almost like a little pickpocket. Can you just see her like sneaking through there? For she said, this is what she said to herself, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt it in her body that she was healed of her disease. Yeah, yeah. So now I can imagine her. She's like, okay, I'm just going to sneak off here. Verse 30, and Jesus, perceiving in himself, there has been a disturbance in the force. <laughs> Jesus, perceiving in, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? 
And the, the tense in the verb, and uh, the, the Greek is, the Old Testament, um, the, the New Testament is written in Greek, and the tense here means he kept on asking, like, like who is that? Who was he? He kept asking, he kept asking until he got an answer here. Who touched my garments? And his disciples said, uh, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who, remember, the crowd's thronging him, right? And like, Jesus, are you trying to be funny right now? Like, should we be going to raise the person from the dead, or uh, the sick girl? Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. It's interesting that the Greek actually says, go into peace. Isn't that interesting? It's not like, be, be peaceful, go in your way. He actually said, step into that shalom of God and stay there, right? Isn't that good? All right, so let's look at the context again. So uh, uh, verse 21, when Jesus had crossed again in the sea, uh, to the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was beside the sea. Again, physically exhausted, I'm sure, a couple of cat naps. Who knows if the disciples were, uh, I mean, Jesus got the little nap in the boat, but they've been uh, up, you know, ministering all day, ministering all night. Here they are again, and uh, they come back to the shore, and like I said, you can almost hear Jesus crying off for sleep, but the people have anticipated him coming. Like, hold on. Is that the Jesus boat? Everybody, Jesus. Everybody gathers around there. And I've seen this on like a minuscule scale when you minister in a third world country. Uh, Remember, like you're you're ministering, crowds are thronging you literally. And you're trying to like sneak back to your tent and they're waiting at the door of your tent. And you're trying to take a nap and they're peeking in the window of your thing. And it's like, I just want to be left alone, right? But Jesus didn't have that luxury of trying to sneak off to a tent. They're like waiting for him everywhere he went. And so someone spots him, the crowd's there, and then comes Jairus. And we're going to look at Jairus' story next week. And he falls at the feet of Jesus. He's an important person. Everybody in in the region knows who he is. And he begs Jesus, come heal his daughter. She's at the point of death. So Jesus is like, let's go. And so now the crowd is going with him. They want to go see this miracle. Apparently their jobs didn't require them to punch and clack. They're just like, they just start going with Jesus. And um, if you've ever been to Israel, oh, which I have (laughs) last month. I think I'm going to keep saying that for a little while here. Uh, you know how narrow those ancient streets are. So you can imagine these thousands of people crowding around Jesus, probably almost like a swelling wave as they're going there. And um, Mark 5, 24, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. That's kind of an interesting word, thronged, isn't it? I mean, it's not one that we use a whole lot. Here's what the word could be translated. Suffocated, and it's the same word used to describe a grape in a wine press. So when the writer of the gospel is remembering back to this story, they're like, it was like having someone take a handful of grapes and squeeze them to the point where all the juice is coming out of them. They're like jammed in there like a jar of olives, right? They're jammed in there like that poor loser in the middle seat in the back of the airplane. (laughs) Like, oh, now I get it, yeah. And so in the Kochi section right there, right? So Jesus, he's moving down the narrow road. You can see Jairus, he's leading the way. He's moving at a fast pace because his little daughter, she's at the point of death. And so, uh, so this story takes place right in the middle of this, uh, of this, it's an interruption. Like Jesus doesn't plan on healing this lady. He's on his way, you can see, like he's focused. And this whole story is an interruption. Jesus is on his way. He, you can imagine he's got his mind on this thing. And have you ever noticed, Jesus is never annoyed uh, at uh, interruptions. I mean, like this isn't the first interruption that Jesus had, and there's, there's gonna be other ones but we never see Jesus frustrated at interruptions. Is anyone uh, feeling convicted right now? Do we need to have an altar call <laughs> for all the frustrated interruption people? Right? I mean, Jesus, he's on an important mission. This girl is at the point of death. Why doesn't Jesus just, uh, you know, sense the power just say, hey, I want to find out more about this. Talk to Peter, and we'll have a little one-on-one when we get, like, that would have been perfectly acceptable. Like, he's, on, he's about important business, but Jesus literally stops and visits with this lady. Like, he's not impatient. It's like he has no concept of time slipping by. He slows down for this one person. It's like, uh, I mean, I can almost feel myself looking at my watch while Jesus is doing this. Like, um, Jesus, Jairus, like, okay, she's healed. We're we're happy. We'll write it down. But Jesus, he looked at interruptions as springboards into another opportunity that his father's leading him into. It's like Jesus thrived on the spontaneous, right? Right? Verse 25, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had 
and she was no better, and was no better, but rather grew worse. And so she had this continual menstrual bleeding for 12 years. You can imagine she's probably pale, probably has dark circles in her eyes. She's probably weak from that condition. She spent her last penny. Now, um, Matthew and Luke also tell the, this, uh, um, this story. Luke was a doctor, and Luke just writes, she was incurable. Okay, he, he just gives us, she was incurable. So you imagine she's going to doctor after doctor. Every time she goes to a new doctor, she has her hopes raised by this new treatment, and then there's just, she's just disappointed all over again. And it says that she suffered much under many physicians. Sometimes the treatment was worse than the, the disease, and that's in modern medicine, okay? You can imagine ancient medicine, like, who knows what the heck they're doing to this poor lady, right? And so, um, again, she's physically weak from losing blood, um, but there's something about this lady you just have to love. I mean, 12 years of disappointments and continual sickness and, and, and uh, you know, all, the, all, the, all the stuff that goes with that. And she gets, hears bad report after bad report. Oh, we can help? Oh, no, nope, there's nothing we can do. Nothing we can do. Bad report for over a decade now. But then she latches on to something about this message about Jesus. And she said, you know, she's believing against all odds. Nothing else humanly possible has worked. And um, here's what I find one of the biggest problems with people when it comes in terms of healing is they allow themselves to be labeled by a doctor. Now, I'm not against doctors or the medical professional guys. We love them. We are so thankful for them. We pray for them. But what we cannot do is uh, beware of anybody trying to name you. Okay? You are that heart case. You're a heart condition person. You're a cancer patient. Uh, you have five months to live, and you begin to think, okay, I'm, I'm Mr. Five Months to Live, and then next month it's, oh my gosh, I'm Mr. Four Months to Live. And if you're in this lady's shoes, you've been told this more than once, been labeled over and over again. Not only has this lady been labeled, but she's got a whole other problem. If you remember the Old Testament, anyone who was on their menstrual cycle was considered unclean. And unclean had to go like outside the camp, right? And so that means she can't go to the synagogue. That means she can't go to the temple. That means she can't go to the festival. So she's had, like, they didn't have internet, so she couldn't, like, log on and watch her favorite preacher. She's, like, kind of cut off from the spiritual community for 12 years now. She's an outcast. And so you can see her dilemma. The doctor said, you're hopeless, you're incurable, and religion has said, you're dirty, you're unclean. And so you can imagine this woman. I mean, this is a, this is a difficult thing. And even if she could uh, muster up the courage as an unclean woman to come to this famous rabbi and present herself to them, if, if, she, if there's any kind of touching there, she isn't going to contaminate him. I mean, does she want that on her conscience doing this? I mean, this is a very religious uh, system back then. And so, uh, and now, and how is she going to get to Jesus? He's never alone. It's not like she can just walk up to him and make an appointment. He's always thronged by the crowds. That means she's going to have to contaminate other people along the way. Mark uh, 5.27 said, she had heard the reports about Jesus. Now, what was she hearing about Jesus? Okay, we don't know exactly but she must have heard something that he is superly, super abundantly willing to heal anybody who comes to him. Like he's proven it on case after case, the most extreme different types of thing, over and over again. One thing, one thing you know about Jesus, you come to him, you're getting healed. Oh, if we could get that same revelation. Because in, in case you didn't connect the dots, every person who came to Jesus in the Bible was healed. He never said, oh, it's not my time. Oh, you're right in the middle of an important lesson. Ooh, better deal with that sin. Ooh, you're unclean. Oh, you've got generational curses. Oh, you don't have enough faith. They got to Jesus. They got everything they needed. And he hasn't changed. So from all the stories she's heard, Jesus has demonstrated his willingness over, over every conceivable situation to heal. And so she's, maybe she's thinking something like, listen, I'm assuming he's willing and his power is so great, he even raises the dead. But how am I going to connect with that power? I can't even get near this guy. There's no way I'm going to get a one-on-one -on -one with him. And, uh, and so rather than wallow in self-pity, she gets this idea. And i, I got to believe it's a God idea. She gets this God idea. Listen, I don't have to ask him. I don't have to try to get close to him. If I can just touch the edge of his clothes, if I can just do this. And guys, this had never happened before. It wasn't like, yeah, I heard about this person over in Africa who tried this, and maybe I'll try this. Like, like this had never happened before. In Mark 5, 27, she had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and mugged the healing from him. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you got a picture like a pickpocket being sneaky. I mean, she's in there. And she touched his garment, for she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. Where in the world did she get this idea to touch his garments? Okay, came up behind him and touched his garments. Luke uh, says, and Matthew say, touch the edge of, her uh, edge of his cloak. Okay? 
So one translation of the Bible says the hem of his garment. What's it talking about? It's talking about the edge of his prayer shawl. So Jewish men back then, they would have wore, they wore a prayer shawl. It had four corners and had these tassels on the end of it. And uh, over in Numbers 15, 38 through 41, it tells us that these tassels were symbolic. And so the Jewish man would wear them. They were called tzitzit, which I think is also a Greek sauce or something like that. You put on yourself. But, <laughs> but uh, the tzitzit, and um, uh, God's the God of symbols. And here's what God was saying in, those things, in, in, the, in the passage. He says, um, whenever you see a tassel, whether you're wearing it and you notice it, or you're walking behind someone and you notice it, here's what I want you to remember. I want you to remember that I am the God of covenant who has committed myself to you, and you are to commit yourselves to me. So every time they saw that tassel, I am serving a God who has committed himself to me. I am serving a God who has committed himself to me. So perhaps she's thinking, man, if I can just touch that reminder of the covenant. What was part of the covenant? Exodus 15:26. I am the Lord your healer. I remove sickness and disease from your midst. Boy, if I can just, if I can just touch that symbol, if I can just touch that point between the invisible realm, that point of contact uh, between the invisible world and this visible world, if I can just touch that. So the uh, Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and that corner of the garment for where it was touched, the, the Hebrew word is kanaf. Can you just keep that in your mind? For, can you just say the word kanaf? kanaf. All right, keep that in your, uh, in your mind for just a moment here, Okay. So every time, she, uh, every time you look at those tassels, you're reminded of, uh, of the covenant. And so um, there was a prophecy in Malachi about the son of righteousness would rise with healing in his wings. You guys remember this in Malachi? Guess what? The word wings is the same word for corner of the garment. It's the word kanaf. So here's this, mis- there's this prophecy that, sh- that, uh, that the Jews were, were waiting for. If I could just touch his kanaf, kanaf there's healing in his Kanaf, the edge of his garment, the tassels. Come on, somebody. And so Jesus, he's, uh, he's making his way through the crowds to heal a young girl who's on the, way, on the verge of death. He's in a hurry, and this woman ra- grabs a hold of the tassel of his garment. In, uh, in, in verse 529, uh, Mark 529, and immediately the flow of blood dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of the disease. So her healing is immediate, but she also felt it, Okay. Sometimes you just know you're healed. There's physical manifestations where you can tell something's happened. I remember one time Mary and I were talking to this physician, and his brother was listening in, and the physician was debating us on whether or not healing was for today. And so this person was real smart, knew a whole bunch of Greek, and is arguing with us about it. So Mary and I are sharing some healing testimonies with this person. And so this person's not convinced by anything we have to say. He's got answers for reasons why those are the exceptions to the rule. The brother's listening to this story, and he had a, a foot that had dropsy in it or, or th- something like that. And so the foot wasn't, it was dragging. And so he, he comes over and we pray for him. And now he's going up and down the steps and his foot's walking normal. Doctor, not impressed. Brother is super excited. The minigans to share us that he had some crazy um, surgery where they had to, something was with his rectum and they had to do some things, take parts from other things and stretch it there. And he no longer has the sensation to know when he has to go to the bathroom. Like he, he doesn't have that feeling in there. And so he's like, do you think Jesus will heal this too? We're like, absolutely. So we pray for him, and he immediately feels, I don't know how else to describe it, like an internal wedgie. Like, like, like something shores up in there, and then all of a sudden he has this sensation for the first time now that he has to go to the bathroom, goes in and goes to the bathroom. Right? So, yeah. Those, doctor, still not impressed. Oh, yeah, you thought he was like fall on his knees and praise God. Yeah, no, actually, he was crying. He was crying a little bit, but still wanted to argue. And so, um, so um, sometimes divine healing will come with a feel. You know, what did it say? It said um, she felt in her body. Sometimes healing will happen where you will feel it in your body. Um, some kind of, here's some common manifestations. Sometimes there's a feeling of heat. Okay, you, the, the part of your body, let's say you're getting prayer for your shoulder, sometimes you'll feel your shoulder get hot, and uh, that's, that's a sign that the healing anointing is flowing on you. It's less common, but um, sometimes there's a feeling of cold that accompanies healing. It's the same thing as, as, as the heat. Sometimes there's a strong feeling of electricity or a less strong feeling of a tingling that often accompanies the gift of miracles. Sometimes you get both manifestations. Here's what I want you to get. None of these manifestations are actually needed to heal the sick. Okay, they're great when they happen. Okay, some are healed and they feel absolutely nothing. Others, they begin to feel something and they do this. Okay, so God commonly gives manifestations to just let you know something is happening. All right, but I want you to get this. 
For the one being healed, faith in Christ comes first, then possibly manifestations. It's not manifestations, then faith. I'm gonna say it again, because this one's important, okay? For the one who's being healed, the one who's receiving healing, it's faith in Christ first, then maybe manifestations. It's never manifestations, something's happening, then I'll believe. A lot of people are waiting for something to happen to believe. Jesus says, believe and then receive. A lot of Christians are doing it backwards. They're waiting to feel better, and then I'll believe Christ is my healer. No, no, no. You believe Christ is your healer, then the manifestation happens. How are we doing? That was one of the major points there, in case you're wondering. So this woman, she feels the power of God connect to her body, and the source of her problem is healed, and she can imagine she's standing there bug-eyed in a state of euphoria. I mean, 12 years of an absolute nightmare. She knows it's suddenly ended, and now the crowd just surges on. They just sweep right past her, and she's going to sneak out. This is what she wants. I mean, she's, she's unclean. She's been touching everybody. And Jesus stops, and thousands of people who are, like, crowding him like a, a can of sardines, thousands of people, they instantly stop. And Jesus, verse 30, and Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? Who was that? Who, who, who's touching my garments? And, uh, and his disciples said to him, uh, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? So Jesus felt power. Uh, the New Testament word there is dunamis, meaning it's Holy Spirit power. Everyone's pressing in on him, but Jesus was able to feel the Holy Spirit leave him and touch one woman. Here's my question. How did Jesus live in the constant conversation with people's needs and yet be so aware of the Holy Spirit's presence within him? I'm asking God to teach me that because that's not in the pages. It's not like you're going to go and go, oh, this is how he did it. But we know Jesus had such a relationship with the dove, such a relationship with the Holy Spirit that he could actually sense when the Holy Spirit had gone out. I heard Bill Johnson say something that was super powerful because I think the temptation is I want to get close to God so that I can heal the sick more. Uh, he says, I don't want to develop intimacy with God just so he will bless me. That's professional intimacy. What do we call people who have intimacy as a profession? Don't say it out loud. You just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. On the count of three, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> Bill goes on, he says, I want to develop tenderness so that he's giving me the most incredible invitation to simply be the one who loves Jesus. The one who turns my affection towards him. The one who learns to host his presence. Well, I think that's some great language for uh, just how Jesus walked. In um, another story Bill tells, he says, if you're going to walk across the room with a dove on your shoulder, how would you do it? And he says you would do it, uh, uh, taking every step with the dove in mind. And we see this is a model how Jesus lived his life. Somehow he was able to do this. And so we get to go on this journey of uh, being the one who simply loves Jesus, who turns our affection towards him and learns to host his presence. Here's the deal. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit lived on the inside of him, rested upon him. We get that same privilege, okay? And so, um, uh, and so that faith of that woman, she touches that, and somehow it puts a demand on it, and now it comes into her. So you can see Jesus is carrying power. She touches it. So let's look at this verse. There's a verse that says, freely you've received, freely you give. Now, I, I speak at, uh, at conferences sometimes, and people use this a lot of times in offerings, Freely you've received, freely give. But the context of this is actually supernatural ministry. Okay? So listen to this implication. I've received something, now I'm able to give away something. Okay, so what is it that you've received? You've received the Holy Spirit. He's the greatest gift you could ever have. He's the one who's living inside of you. And as we minister into the anointing, we're actually giving away the presence of God. We're actually imparting the presence of God to others. And Jesus went on to teach what it meant to give it away. He says obvious things like when you heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, cast out demons. But he adds this one in Matthew 10, verse 12. When you go into a house, let your peace come upon it. There's actual impartation of presence. Guys, you and I are called to be, well, we're not called to be, we are this by virtue of who Jesus has made us to be, atmosphere shifters. So uh, people are like, oh, my workplace is so dark. Well, why do you think you're there? You were born to shine. Stop cursing your calling. There's never a battle between light and darkness. Light turns on, darkness flees. So let it shine. So he's made us to be stewards of the presence of God. It's not like we can just manipulate him for our own purposes, but we sense him, we co-labor with him, and we, begin, and we can go into atmospheres and literally shift those atmospheres. 
Give God a chance to do what only he can do. Listen, guys, I don't see everyone that I pray for healed. I'm not even close to batting a 1,000. But you know what? I'm seeing a lot more people healed when I pray for more people to be healed. And so will you. (laughs) More people will be healed when you pray for more people. You can write that one down. I I just, I, I feel really confident in saying that one. God is looking for people who are willing to be smeared by him, allowing his presence to affect others for the good. I heard a minister say this. This minister, uh, I think it was David Hogan who said it. He sees a lot of people raised from the dead. He said, the difference between you and me is this. If I pray for a dead person and they're not raised from the dead, I pray for the next person too. I don't quit. That's not bad. You can apply it to sickness. You can apply it to anything you want. So everyone, I want you to get this. Everyone in the crowd had access to what this woman received, but her touch was different. She wasn't the only one who touched Jesus. There was lots of people touching him, but there was something different. So a woman reaches out, touches his tassels, and he stops and says, who touched me? And the disciples are like, "Uh, it's an obvious answer. Everyone's touching you, Jesus, right? But Jesus wasn't looking for someone who uh, physically touched him. He was looking for a particular touch. This person had a touch that was motivated by faith. It was that touch of faith. And so Jesus says, who touched me? See, most people think that when someone reaches out to God for a need, uh, whether it's healing, finances, whatever it might be, that it goes something like this, that um, God, I, I, will, will, you, will you meet this need? And they're reaching out. And uh, God up in heaven says, hmm, uh, let me see how worthy you are. Um, have you been good enough? Have you been moral enough? Um, have you fasted long enough? Um, have enough other people been praying for you? If we can just get all these people praying no, just one, one prayer of faith will do more than 10,000 people praying in doubt and desperation. Um, let me see if you're spiritually hungry enough. There is a big movement about being so hungry for Jesus. Guess what? You're never going to be hungry enough. If your standard is to be hungry enough so that God, God, God's not moved by hunger, he's moved by faith. Um, let's see if your situation is desperate enough. Oh, God moves only on the desperate. No, he, he like t- turned some water into wine at a wedding. Like It wasn't like the world was going to end. Are we okay? And so, so what people believe is, is based on God's evaluation, he either releases his power and you get healed, or he retains his power and says, nope, you haven't prayed enough, uh, you aren't holy enough, you haven't fasted enough, and you have this sin in your life, and until you deal with it, I won't heal you. That's how most people are thinking God is, is they come to him and he evaluates them. And um, guys, this story with the woman completely kills this misperception. Faith touched the Son of God. He didn't go, hmm, 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 hmm. Who, who, who is this? Let me see if you're, no, she got healed before he starts the interview. Yeah. Healing is like a pickpocket reaction. When faith touches the Son of God, healing manifests. This shows that the power of God flows under laws. There's, there's laws in how the kingdom of God works. There's the ways of God. And when you tap into these laws, the power of God just flows. The Lord doesn't size up one person and says, you're worthy, I'm going to release my power on you, and then looks over at the other person and says, no, you're not worthy, I'm going to retain my power. There's laws at how it works. Guys, it's not about God loving one person more than another or having some divine plan for one person to be healed and one to be sick. It's not about that. It's a matter of this is how his kingdom works. Guys, electricity operates under laws, okay? If you're grounded and you grab a live wire, you're going to access that power is gonna go through you and you're going to die, it's not like the electric company's up there going, hmm, <laughs> let's teach them a lesson. No, the electric company's not even aware of what's happening. It's, this is how this law works. Birds can go land on that same high wire, but because they're not grounded, they're okay. It's not because the electric company loves birds more than people. <laughs> There's laws to how these things work, okay? Guys, electricity, it's been around since creation. Lightning storms, static electricity, all these type of things. People could have act, uh, um, accessed electricity years ago, thousands of years ago, but they were ignorant to how these laws worked. Okay, God didn't just create electricity a few hundred years ago and, uh, with the, you know, the kite and the, and the lightning storm and all that stuff. Electricity's always been available and uh, waiting to be harnessed to be used. And guys, it's the same in the spiritual realm. Okay? It wasn't, uh, uh, it's not like God is up there on a case-by-case basis deciding who gets, there's laws. And when you access those laws through faith, it manifests for you, okay? Healing has always been around. 
all right? And so I think a lot of people think, well, the first 200 years of the church, you know, things were going good, but then it kind of cooled down, and oh, and so they started inventing these doctrines. Well, why, why, did the, why did the power leave? The power left because people weren't accessing it. Oh, well, then, you know, 1,700 years later with the Azusa Street Revival, and God must have flipped the power back on. It's like he had it off for all these years. Guys, that's not what was going on. Um, <laughs> All, the, all those influx of healings that happened at the, uh, at the Azusa Street Revival and have continued on through today, it's because people began to cooperate with the laws. Oh, God wants me well. I believe that. I receive that. Okay? It isn't God who isn't healing or blessing you. It's not the Lord who has willed you to suffer. God's created laws. And when we understand how these things work, how it works, by his stripes, I, you were healed. It is a past tense event. He already said yes 2,000 years ago. And when I cooperate with that and I believe and receive, or you can doubt and do without. How we doing? You might be thinking, Jim, I disagree. That puts the responsibility on me. You're saying it's up to me to take hold of what God has provided? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay, I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad. And I understand that there's been things in the past couple decades where people have been made to feel like it's all your fault and this and that. I haven't found it helpful to find if it's my fault you weren't healed because of, of the prayer or your fault or this and that. I haven't found that. What I've found helpful is to look in the face of Jesus, dive back into that ocean of grace and go back and for that. And, and it, the, the blame game isn't super helpful. It wasn't helpful in Job's day. Job blamed God. He was wrong. Job's friends blamed Job and said, oh, it must be your lack of faith, must be your sin in your life. And I like, 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 the blame game isn't super helpful. What's helpful is to look afresh at the face of Jesus. Just, just to be clear, if someone is not healed, the problem is on the human side of the equation, not on the God side of the equation. Now, if that makes you feel guilty, um, get your eyes back on Jesus. So if you're feeling guilty, you're just looking at yourself. That makes me feel bad. This and this, not helpful. Faith is like an eyeball. An eyeball looks out. If you took out that eyeball and turned it in, it's no longer functioning like an eyeball. Faith looks at Jesus. And faith begins to say, I feel bad. You're putting the responsibility on me. This and that. That's not faith. Faith looks at Jesus. So I just encourage you. I'm not trying to put shame or guilt on anybody, but if I don't tell you the truth, you're going to still look at yourself in your own navel and trying to figure out what's wrong. Is God devaluating me? How are we doing? God's already done his part. But Christ is not in control of this healing he did not know that this woman was going to be healed. Christ's own faith was not even directly involved in this woman's healing. She received what she expected from God. Are we okay? Yeah. Mark 5, verse 32, and he looked around to see who had done it, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. She just spilled the beans. And I said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And so Christ revealed what caused this woman to be healed. It wasn't the magic tassel. It's not like, okay, guys, here's what we need to start doing. We're going to have some tassels. And uh, I'm going to be wearing them. And if you guys will follow me around during work, like, it's, not, it's not about the tassel ministry. What, what, what was, you know, uh, ooh, I got some oil from Jerusalem. Let's anoint it. Ooh, it's, it's Jerusalem oil. Well, no, no. What's it say? It says um, when you anoint it with oil, the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. Okay, sometimes there's a contact point between heaven and earth. Sometimes there's, there's that, that, that point of contact, the grabbing of the tassel. Well, he didn't say it was, the, it was my tassel that made you well. You know, good job figuring that out. He said, your faith has made you well. Guys, we need to take this seriously. Eighteen times in the New Testament, Jesus said, your faith has made you well, or something similar to that. And some people think that condemns people are sick. And like I said, I know, I know people have done that. But we can't afford to react negatively to the truth because it's been abused in the past. Amen. Believers must agree with Christ. It was her faith that made her well. Amen. Guys, there's four people involved in this equation. God the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, and the woman. Okay? Christ was the focus of this woman's faith, but his will had nothing to do with this. Okay? The Father had already revealed his will. God wants you well. The Holy Spirit carried out the Father's will in response to her faith as Christ as healer. Okay? But Christ credits the healing to the woman's faith. Okay? And my last point here, faith is infectious. Faith is infectious. Look what happens. We know this woman is healed because of her faith, not because of her tassels. Okay? But the faith of this woman in the story, it spreads. Here's what happens to, uh, in the next chapter in Mark. We're in Mark 5, here's Mark 6, 56. And wherever Jesus came... 
in villages, cities, or countryside. They laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched it were healed. Isn't that powerful? This one little lady who she got this idea goes and, and, and touches it. And so Oral Roberts, he came up with this phrase. I've already used it a couple times. He talked about a point of contact. And sometimes he'd be preaching on TV, and he'd say, lay your hands on the TV. Now, there's nothing magical Oral Roberts was trying to say about the TV, but it was a point of contact. Uh, it's like, so I can contact the invisible world in the visible. Okay, and uh, she believed that Jesus would heal her, but how can I connect to it? And for her, it was, boy, there's this sign of this covenant. There's a sign of the, of the healing in his wings. Some, uh, it's, it's kind of the same thing with communion. I believe communion is more than just symbolic. It actually says you're eating and drinking a life, or if you're doing it the wrong way, eating and drinking uh, judgment on yourselves. There's actually something, what are we doing? We're contacting the invisible with the visible. Same with the anointing of sick with oil. There's nothing magical about the oil. I don't believe there's anything magical about necessarily the bread and that, but there, there's something, it's a way of contacting the reality behind it. You guys understand what I'm saying? So with that in mind, try to think of yourselves as tassels on his garment. Try to think of yourselves as tassels, guys. It's um, our hands and our words become the means of healing that Jesus uses. It's a way of people to contact the invisible reality that we're carrying in this physical realm. I hope somebody's getting this. Our hands do not heal, but God heals by our hands. And they become his hands to the person that we lay them on. Let's stand for closing prayer. We should have sold some tassels after service, I swear. <laughs> we could have raised some money for the Normandy Project. It would have been beautiful. I might get some shoes with tassels on. Some ta I used to have some tassel loafers from Johnston and Murphy. I need to get some of those. <sighs> Try to think of you. I'm just going to repeat that part as you're standing here. Try to think of yourselves as tassels on his garment. Our hands and our words become the means by which healing comes. We're that point of contact between heaven and earth, between the invisible and visible. Our hands do not heal, but God heals by our hands, and they become his hands when we lay them on people. Lay your hand on somebody next to you. They probably got something that they need. Scoot over. Jesus, we love you. And so, Lord, we desire to become the kind of people who host your presence well, who turn our affection towards you, who become the kind of people who can sense when you've gone out, <laughs> when you've and when you're doing something and you're leading. And so, Holy Spirit, we hunger to be those people. And so we don't know how exactly how it happened, but we ask you to teach us to become those people who, who can steward that well. And uh, Lord, we become the point of contact. We are the point of contact between heaven and earth. And so as we lay our hands on the person next to us, uh, anything that they need, be made whole. Just say this out loud, out loud go into peace. You're releasing that person to step into the shalom of God that sets everything right. Just say that again. Go into peace in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, our ministry teams, uh, if you would like someone else to uh, lay hands on you, some additional prayers, agreeing with you for needs. Our ministry team's coming up here with hands on. Pretty soon, guys. Guys, this isn't just a sermon. This is equipping you. Y'all are going to be the ones praying for the sick in these healing services. I probably shouldn't have told you the date so you don't stay home afraid. You guys are coming. We're going to come drag you out of your homes. If, you, uh, if you're new here, my wife and I would love to meet you by the uh, I'm Here tab. Bless you guys. Go do something dangerous for the kingdom this week. Bless your children's workers. <laughs>